Cool. I think we're recording. Good deal. Um, let's see. South 30 Farm. Yep. Brian Gallatin. How many acres? 30. Right 30. about 30. Cool. South 30. <laughs> it's a play on words for uh, <laughs> North 40, right? <laughs> yeah. So it actually just worked out. We're in the South. 30 acres. There it, was, it is. Uh, you know, it was pretty funny, so it worked out. Yeah, something I always thought as a kid is, you know, uh, you know, you're back on the North 40 or something, right? So we just <laughs> happen to have 30 acres here, and we're in the South. That's amazing. Super easy. Yeah. That's amazing. Easy name. In uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia, um, corn, soy, wheat, beans, cotton, everywhere else. All around. Here's a perennial polyculture of grass and cows. Talk to me more about your farm Um Maybe even go a little bit into why you guys farm or what you guys farm and we'll yeah. go from there. Yeah, so um, I, you know, I've really got started in it really because I want to raise my own food. Um, you know, with the the current culture of uh, processed foods and grocery stores and stuff like that, I was um, I'm more into health and fitness. I've always been kind of a nutrition guy, and you know, fitness. I've been as I get older, I try to focus more on that. Spartan races, uh, yeah, right? Yeah, so I do Spartan races, so um, I'm fairly competitive at that. So, I, you know, I've been trying to eat uh, as well as I can. Um, but it's, it's getting tough to be able to either, you know, get good stuff from the store without, you know, I don't want to say paying a premium because you're going to pay a premium for good good food, but um, having the availability of it, and, and especially to know for sure how it was raised, what it ate, um, and have some input to that, right? It was really important to me. So um, we, we had been looking for quite a while. Um, you know, it's something I've, I've always wanted to do was to have a, you know, a little homestead or something like that. It's just try to not necessarily go off grid or be a prepper or anything, but just have, you know, be self-reliant in a lot of ways. Yeah. So um, we had been looking and uh, this, this property came up almost five years ago and it checked almost all the boxes, right? It was kind of off the road. Um, it had a good setup. It was more uh, square than rectangular, like a lot of pieces, you know, places are cut in off of uh, old farm fields and stuff like that. Um, it had a pond, has water in the back. Um, and, and most of the pastures were already laid out, you know, because it was an old uh, horse stable. So, um, you know, we ended up putting a bit in it and winning. So it actually worked out pretty nice. Uh, so, you know, we've obviously decided to do some of the infrastructure, um, you know, putting some up additional fences and adding some big animals like you can see in the back. But, uh, you know, we obviously started with chickens, like the, the gateway for gateway animal for everybody. Yep. Um, the We had four or we have two geese now, but they conveyed with the property. So there are there are, you know, resident uh, fun animals to, you know, wake everybody up in the neighborhood when anybody drives down the driveway. But. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of the base um, of how we came to be on the property and um, a little bit of uh, the background on the hows and whys of why I wanted to get into this myself. Yeah, it's interesting. There's, there's, you know, this, this term regenerative, especially the accessibility of regenerative foods in grocery stores seems to be on the rise. And simultaneously, it feels like, you know, especially with people like you or at least in your story, that there's almost an inverse relationship with this. The, the more regenerative food we have accessible in the grocery store the more people i'm running into that actually i mean they might be inspired initially by the idea of regenerative food in a grocery store but then it petrifies them i don't put words in your mouth but maybe talk to that a little bit like a you know uh paralysis by analysis kind of thing it's like Mm -hmm. where do i start right you know so you know to start to become regenerative i think you just sometimes you have to do uh you know ready fire aim you know you just have to do it right um, sometimes it's, uh, you know, it's, it's funny, but sometimes you just have to do, you know, it might not be perfect and, and it probably is never going to be, but, uh, I think the process is just as important as the, the end, the result of what you think it's going to be. Cause that's not what's going to happen. Right. You, you know that as well as anybody, you know, one day I got a perfect fence up and then I'm chasing cows, you know, four <laughs> days in a row and I, which I've done this week. So, yeah, you know, it, it's, um, I think that the process is important and I don't think that, um, I think regenerative regenerative has become a like a buzzword, you know, nowadays. Um, I don't know that a lot of a lot of mainstream Americans really understand what it means um, because you start to see a lot of large businesses, corporations that are starting to use that term. Um, you know, I don't want to say they're all greenwashing, but it seems like there's a lot of companies that are putting those labels on their packaging now and. I don't know necessarily know that um, it's either American raised animals or that it was done in a truly regenerative way, right? You know, are they are they just um, 
buying cap maybe one or two from somebody like us and then saying hey we you know we do regenerative and they're buying or importing the rest of their meat from argentina or something new zealand for you know lambs or whatever but yeah i think it's a it's a I think it's an uphill battle for us to try to get a lot more people to understand what it really takes to be regenerative. Um, and I think that's probably as much of our mission uh, is to get that word out as it is to raise those animals in that way. You yeah. Know? Yeah. That's a really good point. I like that. Um, what was it? Ready, He's fire, aim. Ready, fire, aim. Ready, yeah, fire. I'm, I'm kind of ready. Bam. Let's do it. Right. Yep. Well, it, it seems like there's a particular scale that that works on. And, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, when we think about large organizations like a Walmart, um, they change very slowly. Yeah. They, they adapt very slowly. They move slowly. But smaller organizations, especially like locally owned organizations, just in any industry, pick your industry, you know, to find one to look at, um, they can adapt. They can move. They can be creative. Yeah. They can be fluid. And, and, I, and that's what I mean by scale. It seems like on a smaller regenerative farm, you're able to fire, aim, and then respond and adapt right. and move and sometimes you might move too quickly but the results are very easily identifiable or observable and therefore you can react and change and look at it and that's the observation part of regenerative agriculture that's so vitally important like Masanobu Fukuoka um, an author in the regenerative space back in the 1940s wrote a book One Straw Revolution it's just absolutely gorgeous but he says that the most definitive aspect of what he I think he called it a sustainable or ec ecological farm is the farmer's footprints or how many footprints are on the farm right and that's that's observation it's intimacy and it seems like there's a particular scale to that yeah no i yeah, i agree I, and i think um you know with big corporations obviously they have um i think probably the biggest problem for them is the shareholders right they're they're mm -hmm. always trying to meet a shareholder <laughs> price and our shareholders are ourselves right. um and I think, you know, we are a lot more nimble and, and able to, the, for the ability to scale and, and then also mitigate any of those mistakes that we do make in the, in the interim. Right. But, you know, scale for us is go from, uh, you know, we can double, we can go six to 12, uh, you know, beefs or something like that. You know, so we've had a hundred percent increase and it's not where, you know, that's not something that we can't overcome or, you know, adapt right. to on a fairly, you know, up, up until obviously some amount of scale. Right. But right. I think we have the ability to do um the the scaling and the mitigation of those changes that will come with that you know if right. we do it just i don't want to say on a whim but um at, at a lot more rapid pace than corporations would do right? right and i think that um you know having the ability to do that uh, allows us a lot more um luxuries on you know in the learning space as well too um because you know you have to have uh, those footprints on the ground right you're, you're not going to be able to just double your animals and just put them out there and think that you know, they're going to be fine, you know. Uh, but you have to spend more time out there. And, and I think that's, I think even Wendell Berry said that too. Uh, many people have said that since probably Fukuoka, but um, about, you know, the best way to figure out what's going on is to be out there and be part of it, right? right. You have to be in your farm, um, you know, and that's not necessarily the case in a lot of the, you know, the, the commercial um, industrial agriculture, you know, processes. Mostly uh, there's probably a tractor out on the farm, not, not people and feet, right? right? Right. Talk to me. So we got the cows in the background, yep. this inter interested little steer here. Talk to me more about South 30, a little bit of your practices. You know, what does grass and soil and everything else mean to you? Just get into that a little bit. Yeah. So we, we try to do, um, uh, you know, I, I'm not necessarily the mob grazing, but rotational grazing, right? I don't have, um, I mean, I could probably do smaller paddocks with the, you know, mob grazing, but I don't have the, the large numbers of animals to do that with. So I try to do rotational grazing. Um, you know, maybe a day or two at a time, try to just move them through different areas, depending on the size. And then, you know, it's a little tough now and, you know, we're coming out of winter with, uh, I did save a little bit of stockpile forage in a couple fields, but, um, they threw that pretty quick. So, yeah. uh, but yeah, so now I've been trying to, you know, coming out of winter, bale graze a little bit. So to put some more nutrients on the ground. Um, so a little bit more concentrated as in, uh, you know the the outputs of the animals right so you know right. the the you know, defecation and urination throughout the field um in a smaller field this is about an acre here you know i have eight cows in here now and i'll do a couple brown bales uh for maybe two more days to just add to the soil so as the soil warms back up there's a there's a lot more nutrients in the ground for you know the plants to grow um we're starting to get a little bit of spring pop up now for a couple warm days uh some of the grass is starting to come up so um, you know, I, have noticed, uh, since we've been out here, like I said about four and a half years that the, the amount of the water flow, 
um, the, the diversity of plant species. Uh, even um, I was thinking about this this morning was uh, cattle egrets. Uh, when we first mm. moved out here, I didn't see cattle egrets ever see cattle egrets out here um and then this year we had uh i counted 14 in one day right wow. just sitting on the steers we had six steers back there and they're just loving it right so it was kind of cool to see the you know the increase and obviously that's a that's a, a result of you know just the just the putting back some natural cycles on the land right, right. um to see those animals come back through um the northern harry's been flying around chasing meadow voles and stuff like that so it's been pretty cool to see some of the changes what elevation are we here? Uh, we're, I, where we're probably sitting is probably literally 10 feet above sea level. <laughs> maybe, maybe eight. There's yeah. so much flooding. It's been a very wet winter, and it's like the middle of February. Right. So we're still in winter, although there's grass growing and the uh, red maple yeah. blooming above our heads. Um, but there's, there's so much water yeah. sitting on top of the soil surface all over Virginia Beach and the Norfolk region right. of, of eastern here, Virginia. Um, and we were walking out to this spot to kind of be with the cows and, and have a little conversation here. And you were talking about how originally when you moved onto the land, the water would just sheet across it. Right. And, and now it's, it's a different water pattern. Maybe talk to that. that that's so interesting to me. Yeah. So, so when we came out here, um, like I said, uh, the primary property use was, um, it was like a horse farm. So there was a lady that ran stables out of here and mostly pasture boarded. Um, so really no maintenance or no, um, you know, no time change. It was basically the cow, the horses were just out in the fields at all times. Um, so what I started to notice, there's a lot of bare spots. A lot of, you know, they like to hang out in the same spots. The grass keeps growing in the same spot. They just keep eating it, right? Right. Um, so I noticed that a lot of, there was a lot of bare areas. And um, so I started, I would mow the, some of the weed grass, you know, just keep mowing, 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 just keep it, you know, knock down, make it regrow. And then I noticed, like the way this property set up, it's a, it's a big square, but it actually flows all in a pretty good way it actually flows out and down to the creek in the back well the first couple of years we'd have a you know an inch of rain and there'd be six or eight inches of water just running straight down towards that pond out the back of the stream and then over the last uh, probably two years i've started to notice that yeah there's water running but it's it's like a trickle now um mm. it, there and it actually starts to stay and it actually sinks in a lot more like i don't see the rain flow like i used to flow see um and i think a lot of that is some of the some of the practice we've been trying to put in here is you know now especially with the animals getting those animals on here allowing them to you know just their little you know a hoof print actually will hold you know a cup of water right so right. all of those thousands of hoof prints just there's another spot for it to hold a cup of water um, not going to be long enough to hopefully, you know, graze mosquitoes or anything, but, you know, to slow down the infiltration um, or allow it to infiltrate without it running off. Um, but, yeah, we started to notice a lot of that. I don't really have um, hardly any flow. We had a couple inches in probably a day that, you know, obviously there's a little bit of rain, you know, a little bit coming off of that just because yeah. of the volume. But it's all it's all super clean. It's just that clear water, just rainwater coming off. Yeah. No, no nutrients, no dirt, no soil, no nothing. So wow. it's been pretty neat. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, um, you know, on, in, you go to Whole Foods, you walk in, you get slapped with carbon sequestering meats and products and everything else, and everything's about carbon. And carbon is a very fine thing to be sequestered into the soil, it's true. But what I think a lot of, you know, farmers like yourself are seeing, you know, we're seeing it on, in, in our lands as well, is the hydrologic cycle, the water cycle. It, it's healing. Yeah. When it heals, it is so... Um, undeniably different than right. what we've lived with, you know, our whole lives of flooding and everything else. And with seeing the climate changing to more of a natural disaster type system where, you know, a thousand year floods, 500 year floods are happening at a very regular interval, much earlier than a thousand or 500 years, water movement is becoming a crucial indice yeah. of what regeneration truly means on a landscape. And so seeing it, uh, the soil holding more water, seeing more plants, right, in the soil and the roots are right. holding the soil intact. And so the water flow is checked by that physical barrier that, yeah. that is the plants and the soil is in place because of the roots. And it's, it's a totally different environment. Yeah. And I, I think that's a lot of it is the, the actual mass of the plants is what the slowing that flow is the, probably the one of the, the bigger benefits to some, mitigating some of the flooding, right, in, in all areas. Um, not only does it help to slow the flow to, you know, increase the infiltration rates, but just the physical slowness, slowing down of that water makes a right. huge difference in, in the potential flooding. Um, and it also creates um, like little microclimates, right? The more grass you have, um, the more, you know, aspir you know, respir transpiration, whatever the proper term yeah. is that they have in that local area, 
um, the more moisture you have in the area, the more, and then potentially the have more rain also to come back down so right. you can actually create your own little micro cycles or you know micro um, ecologies of uh, you know like a water cycle on your own property right you right. don't have to have a million acres to do that you can do it in your small areas too yeah yeah absolutely well as as we wrap this up a couple key questions so like um you know i think a lot of consumers today and and, and maybe it's the the rise of regeneration maybe it's just the inner yearning and the soul of of humankind to want to be with the land whatever it is you know, we have this very re uh, romantic relationship with agriculture. So you've been on the land, we're on your farm, it's the middle of February, we're just getting through winter. Winter's a very hard season on farms, especially in a very wet and low environment yeah. like Virginia Beach. W what's one hurdle, um, or maybe two, if, whatever, just a couple hurdles that, that you've faced in your farming, um, you know, time here um, that you didn't expect or that was impassable alone or... I don't know. Sh sh share something with us that gets a little deeper. Yeah. So I, uh, let me see. Like, what the some of the biggest hurdles is probably um, just trying to. Maybe it's the. I don't want to say the daily maintenance, but the daily, uh, like you said earlier, by getting your feet out on the ground, right? Is just some days it's uh it's wet and like you need to drag a new uh, wire, water line up to the front of the property, right? So you're pulling out 500 feet of poly pipe or something like that that you're, you know, doing by yourself in the morning before, you know, or at sunrise so you can go do your, you know, nine to five job or whatever that is, right? Um, just some of those little things that I don't think people think about, you know, it's like you said, the romanticized version of uh, farming is us sitting here like this, right? Yeah. With, you know, yep. having 10 cute little cows <laughs> behind us and it's all nice. There's a little bit of grass growing, it's some hay nice around breeze. us, but yeah, there's a breeze. The sun's beautiful. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, people don't see the, the work that people put in, right? I think that's yeah. the, that was the shocker. You know, I think, oh, I was, I'll do big animals because it's like, they eat grass. As long as they got water, it's pretty simple. Yeah, it's not really that simple. I mean, you're, you're constantly moving fence, um, you know, to, to, to keep that, you know, regeneration so they don't build up too much in some areas or, you know, beat it down too far. Um, and then to keep those nutrients moving across the property. Um, you know, we moved every couple of days across our 30 acres um, over last spring and into the fall. You know, so as every other day, we're pretty much moving, um, and we worked their whole way around the property, and, and then worked them back up to the front of this field here today. So, um, you know, but just moving water, um, and sometimes you just can't get the tractor in, so you're dragging the water troughs by yourself. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, pulling power, uh, redoing electric fence, you know, making sure the chargers are up, and everything's hot. Hopefully, not touching it yourself to find <laughs> out. You know, there are just a lot of little things I think that are. Uh, you know, part of the learning evolution yeah. that, um, you know, I might not have thought fully through, yeah. but, it, you know, but it's part of the, it's part of the joy of learning. And, you know, some of the, some of the things, uh, the struggle, right, I think is, it's the process that I enjoy. Yeah. You know, I really like that. You know, I, I took four steers at a processor the other day and, you know, it was kind of one of those, uh, I'm sure there was a, a proper word for it, but it was like, you know, bittersweet doesn't really do it justice. It was, um, it was like a joyous sadness, right? Like I was mm -hmm. happy that I took them um, and that I was able to do that and provide uh, for, you know, friends and family and, you know, my neighbors around here. Um, but it was a little sad. You know, I had I'd been out basically on the field with them every day for 10 months. Uh, you know, so it was a little bit tough to, you know, drop them off and know that that was that was coming. Right. But, yeah. you know, the but to know that they will uh, not go to waste and they were, had, had a good life here. You know, they yeah. were out, you know, had a very good life. But. Um, just some of those things that, uh, yeah, you struggle with, you know, the, the end part is, you know, yeah. the, the process is what I try to focus on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, I, I said this the other day and, um, it's a weird way of saying it and I need to find a better one, but like, I, I think we need to start, um, focusing on like the humanness of our food. And it's kind of sounds like cannibalism, which is why it, it needs a better term. But like, if you can't sit at your dining room table and say, Brian, raise this food right right brian's hoof prints are on the land that regenerated via this food like if you can't form that sentence we are we are disconnected from any system of value yeah and, and i think we lose our humanness I, I think being able to participate in that system is to be a human itself it's not to be a great human or to be a healthy human right good food is healthy food i understand that but just to be a human yeah we have to really understand the humanness of the food and i, I think that's what you're saying yeah and, and yeah that, i think that's uh, that's probably a better way to put it but I, I do believe that we've been so far removed from our food system that um people just don't realize um what 
what it takes to put food on their table, right? Yeah. Um, you know, without it being a processed food, but to have real whole food put on your table, somebody's put in a lot of work to get that to you, right? And it would be great if everybody that ate ate dinner tonight, uh, you know, had uh, their steak dinner, hopefully, and said that, hey, I know the farmer, that we, I know at least the farm where it came from, right? Yeah. And I've been out there. It would be great if they could say, hey, maybe I even picked out the cow, right? Yeah. You know, just to have that level of intimacy, not necessarily where they had to take part in the processing or the butchering or anything like that, but just to be aware that um, we are all connected, right? Uh, that's yeah. part of the the humanness of, um, you know, not necessarily human, but, you know, just Mother Nature as a whole, right? We are all, all in this earth together, yeah. um, people, animals, all the above. So I think that um, how we have to be aware of that and not be so far removed like we are today. I think we if we get back to that a little bit. Um, you know, maybe we'd be a little bit happier as a, as a, a race of uh, yeah. humans, right? You yeah. Know? Yeah. I think we're so focused, like a lot of the, the nutrition coming out today has us focused on this and it's again, not a bad thing, but like you are what your food eats, like there's books titled this, but I think it's also true that you are like what the community that produces yeah. the food eats you, or, or whatever you phrase that sentence. But like the, the consumer, when they're eating a South 30 steak is as much a part of South 30 and Brian Gallatin's journey as you are a part of theirs. Right. And it, there's that interconnection that, you know, you, human community, world's community, mother nature, whatever it is, it's nature, it's just everything, right? It's all one totality. Yeah. And I think it's that, that, that mer you know, convergence maybe is a good word that brings out the health here, it brings out the health there, and, and that's where we can actually manifest a much more beautiful right. world. Yeah, and I think um, to tie into that, there's like a, you know, there's some terroir that comes along with that, right? Yeah. So, you know, there are some people that believe that, um, you know, the sun that strikes a specific area, how it affects those plants are, you know, it's kind of like way that people eat honey that's local, right? That right. has the, the local pollens and stuff like that that'll help you. Um, there are, I don't, not necessary studies, but papers that have been written about people that, uh, you know, the, the plants and animals and everything that come from an area are probably better for you than animals or plants or something that are coming from even a thousand miles away, maybe even 500 miles, right? Because they're from your environment. You know, they have had the same amount of sun that you've had. They've had the yeah. same water, the same air, uh, those kind of things. So they're going to be more in tuned. Um, you'll be more aligned, let's say, you know, from yeah. a, you know, a, a holistic way um, internally and externally to those animals and plants, you yeah. know, that, that come from that e area. E even in, I mean, this is part of Commons' mission, um, you know, as, as it becomes more successful and as it, it emerges into a much more stable state to even decentralize even further, because we are still in Virginia. I left this morning. I'm here this morning, right? It's not that far of a drive, yet it's in a totally different ecosystem. Right. It's a totally different political and social economy. I mean, there's a, there's a, the, all of your cherry blossoms are out. There's yeah. red buds. There's a red maple above us that is absolutely about to throw out leaves. I mean, we have a beech tree right behind us that's throwing out spring growth. Right. Or your grass is growing. We're still locked in winter. Yeah. And, and, and we're just central Virginia, right? right? And so I think there's a further need not just to eat local in the sense that, like, you know, it's United States based or instead of New Zealand yeah. or, you know, instead of ordering meat from Austin, Texas, like, and that's local. Like, I mean, like local. Right. I mean, hyper, if, if hyper local, hyper local, like if you don't have a red maple flowering above right. your head, eating the beef, right, that's being yep. grown underneath the flowering red maple in the middle of February, it's not going to be the best for you that it totally could agree. be. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the, there maybe there's even some type of metric for hyper local, like. If I put it in the cooler without ice, we'll make it to your house without <laughs> defrosting, right? You know, yeah, how, how close can you be that I don't have to, uh, you know, bring in a refrigerated truck or packed on dry ice, right? Yeah. You know, those should be the, there should be some limiting factor yeah. there, Like, right? everybody always laughs at us because, you know, we, we distribute, you know, a, a good amount of meat every month to, to our amazing community. And um, it always arrives in some van, Right. Like like uh, like a like a mo like a soccer van, right, you right, know what right. I'm trying to say? Like it's, yep. it's everybody's expecting like a big you know refrigerated truck yeah. to pull up with Commons logo on it, right. and it's it is is you know it's probably my wife or you know some other yeah. you know just individual that wants to make a little bit of side income, and they drove their van. You know, yep. there's car seats in the back, and there's a bunch of meat. Right. It, right. It's 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 human. Yeah. It's human scale. And, and that's what it should be. It's not, you know, like you said, everybody's expecting this big monster, uh, you know, Penske truck or something exactly. like that that's packed full. And there's, you know, 500 people that are offloading and right. um, and then it's going into some locker, you know, storage locker for a couple of days until you come and get it. It's no, you're, you know, you're actually bringing it to the farm to you, um, you know, like by, you know, it's almost like two guys in a truck kind of, you know, the, exactly. the joking term, right? But yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, one mom in a van. Right. Is, yeah, exactly. That's how it's currently Which is even, even cooler, right? Yeah, two guys I think in a so. truck. Yeah. It's I even think better. So. It's even more real. Yeah. 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 We need we need to return the realness. Um, and 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 it's it's I think it's, it's it has to be founded in farms like this. And yeah. and I don't want to just praise you because you're sitting next to me, but it, it's it's really true. You know, and and your farm's thirty acres. One of our farms in Northern Virginia that some of these cows even come mm-hmm. from, they're twelve hundred acres. Right. And so we're not, I'm not saying that everybody needs to run a five thirty acre farm, whatever right. it is. It's it's whatever is contextualized to the human scale for you. Obviously, Bruce Johnson at Dragonfly yep. can do it very well on some larger acreage, and and you've been blessed with this land, and you can do it very well for this acreage, and and that's beautiful. And we need to celebrate that right. individuality within the collective. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I, yeah, I don't I don't want um, anybody that's listening to be thinking about oh, I have to have uh, 30 acres to get started or something. Um, you know, could you do it on an acre? You could probably raise a cow calf on an acre. I mean, you're gonna have yeah. to probably supplement some hay, but you could do it. Or maybe just put four or five sheeps out there. Yeah. Um, you know, you can start on a lot smaller scale than a lot of people think, right? Um, you know, even, um, you know, to start smaller animals, uh, to you know, get a feel for it. And then maybe some property opens up. But, yeah, I don't think you need to have, um, you know, 30 or 100 or 500 acres to get started in this. It, that's probably even cost prohibitive to even start that way for a lot of people. So yeah. maybe a couple acres maybe a lease um, from a local farmer. I mean, you cut out a little section in the back corner of one of their pastures or one of their, you know, old soybean fields, and you can put right. some forage down there and, uh, you know, put a fence around and, you know, yeah. give it a go that way. That might be a good way for a lot of people to start, too, is, yeah. um, you know, you keep it local, keep it near you, and you know, be able to raise your own. Right. Yeah, that's it's, it's, it's so important. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. you for all the work you do, too. Hey, we're blessed. We're all... Uh, Hoping to try to make commons uh, something <laughs> ginormous, right? You know, make ginormously yeah. small. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Ginormously small. Scalable to our scale, right? <laughs> Absolutely. On the way we can do it. But, well, thanks yeah. again. The cows are pretty nice. They yeah, didn't come up and good. lick us. I thought they would. Yeah, they're usually a little more, maybe because we're talking, they're a little more curious normally, but. Probably smell like our cows. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Let me stop this. <laughs>